There we go. Yeah. All right, we'll be at 533 towards the top where it says the words, the Tanya now encourages us. So it's all the way towards the top of the page. If you're looking at um, on the Kindle page, yeah, 533. And if you're looking at the Kindle page, we'll go back just a little bit, one page, just to get a little bit of a summary here. Right in the middle of the Kindle or on the top of 533, the Tanya now encourages us that even if we find meditation difficult, everyone has the potential to reach at least yiratata, which in the English we translated as lower reverence for God. But nevertheless, so now let's see that inside, even a feeble soul can sustain focused thoughts about God with difficulty and through persistence. If you put the effort, you will see the results through a determined effort to focus the mind intently with profound concentration thinking deeply about the greatness of God for a prolonged period, then this will definitely result in him at least acquiring the lower reverence mentioned above. And as the sages of blessed memory said of the fruitfulness of effort, if a person says, I put in a lot of effort and I haven't succeeded, don't believe him. But if he says, I have put in a lot of effort and I have succeeded, believe that person, believe him. Because we are guaranteed when we put in the effort, you will see the results. So you, you will see success. Then you should believe that person. The Tanya's assurance that your persistent meditation will definitely result in a feeling of reverence takes for granted that you have first repented from your sins. And then we quoted this last week, that if a person immerses in a mikvah holding an impure object, does it count? No. So, of course, a person has to be in the teshuva process for this meditation for this meditation to um, take effect. Um, like we say in Sefer Chassidim, the presence of any unrepented sins may act as an obstacle to the meditative process. <clears throat> oh, let me just say in the English, an inspiration for sustained meditative efforts can be found in the verse, and this is from Solomon in the book of Mishlei in Proverbs, if you seek it like silver and search for it like buried treasure, then will you understand the reverence of God? Meaning you have to put in the effort like it's a treasure and you will see the, the uh, you'll, you'll, you'll seek it out. You'll find it. Meaning that just like a person searching for a buried treasure hidden in the depths of the earth will make a huge effort digging for it since he knows that it's definitely there in the same way you must make a huge effort to reveal the fear of heaven, which is treasured and hidden well away. Where is it hidden? In the depth of the understanding heart. Like it says from Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers, of every person in Israel, since you know that it's there. <clears throat> so what we see here so beautifully written and quoting from different verses from the from from the Torah, from Tanakh, and also from the Talmud, is that we already have it inside of us. The meditation is there to dig it out, to seek it out from inside of us, um, and that's where you'll find the um, das hidden and tucked away in your heart. And as long as your teshuva process has begun, which means you're not in the thick of sin, but you're regretting it, you're repenting from it, then allowing. Uh, the meditation will uh, will bring the dash through and enhance your reverence of God. All right, let's see further. The verse in Proverbs, which is Mishle from Solomon, if you seek it like silver and search for it like buried treasure, suggests that reverence of God is not something that really needs to be acquired. It just needs to be discovered. It's hidden inside you like a buried treasure. And you will find it if you dig and search hard enough by means of the appropriate meditations. The verse promises that if you dig effectively, then you will understand the reverence of God, which the Tanya interprets to mean an, an, an unearthing of the understanding heart of every person in Israel. So again, it's, it's an interesting, you know, not again, but let's, let's just explain this. Usually understanding, you would, un, you would correlate that with your mind. When your mind understands something, ah, you got it. But over here, we're calling, we're calling it 
a binat halev, an understanding heart. Because that's the ability of das, is not only to um, uh, trigger the mind into it, but it transfers it to the heart, to the feelings. So therefore, it's called an understanding heart. Usually, understanding and heart don't go together. Understanding is in the mind, and healing is in the heart. But over here, it's combining the two together to be an understanding heart. Because that's what's the, the uh, success of our mission of digging. Then the reverence of God will be understood even in your heart. Beautiful. This understanding heart is, and I'm just going to turn the page here, is an innate quality and level which transcends time, which means that you can definitely access it at any time. Your heart will inevitably feel a variety of different emotions at different times. But the understanding of your heart refers not to actual feelings, but to the heart's innate capacity for emotional intelligence, a power which is not limited to a particular circumstance or time. Your capacity to revere God is not dependent on any temporal or external factors. Rather, it is a treasure which you can unearth at any time. So again, the, the, it's, it's an amazing quality that at any given moment, not depending on your mood at that time, or not depending <clears throat> on an external factor, you could dig inside of you and, and relate or reveal this quality of Das and, and um, shine this ability of Yira, of reverence for God at any time, which is an amazing thing. <clears throat> Usually you would think that the time of prayer is a time that you can really tap into it. Of course, because meditation is synonymous with prayer. That's when you close your eyes and you think about the, and you appreciate what God has given you which is one of the important factors of prayer. Prayer is not only requesting your needs. Prayer is also praising God and thanking God for what you have. So during the time of prayer, obviously then the meditation and the ability to tap into this das is, is shining and is, is available. But the beauty of this paragraph is that also... It, you need something, honey? Yeah, yeah, sure. Right there. Thank you. Of course. At any given moment, not only during the time of prayer or the fulfillment of a mitzvah, but at another time as well, you're able to tap into this das. You're able to have this meditation um, because it's an understanding heart that is not a specific, based on a specific um, mood that you're in, or it's not based on a specific factor around you or people that you're around. It's at any moment you can tap into it, which is awesome. And this treasure is the inherent dormant reverence referred to above at the beginning of chapter 41, which is always present, at least in a dormant state, in every soul of Israel. If you remember at the beginning of chapter 41 that Nancy, Nancy has told us that she has it written out and she thinks about it often, that those first few lines, it says that it's something that we each, each one of us have, this ability of Yira of God, this ability of reverence of God, it's something we have inside of us. It's dormant and it needs to be awakened. And the meditation awakens it. So uh, it's always there. It's inherent and it's, it's within us. However, as we have consistently stressed in this chapter 42, if your inherent reverence remains dormant and hidden, it isn't of any use to you. It may already be a treasure in your possession, but in order to cash it in, sorry, in order to cash it into usable currency, you need to do some serious meditative work. Only by nourishing your das will you be able to access your dormant reverence and begin to actually feel it. So you have it inside of you, but unless you use it, unless you cash it in, it's worthless. How do you cash it in? By using your das through meditation and then awakening this reverence. And then you can feel it inside of your heart. <clears throat> Um, let's just see the practical lesson now. On 534, if you're on the Kindle, you don't have it, but I will read it out loud. It's just a few lines, and it goes like this. Even if you don't find it easy to focus your thoughts, with a determined effort, you will succeed. Imagine you were looking for a hidden treasure that you knew was there. You would give all the effort you can to find it because you know it's there. So knowing that the, the Yira is inside of you, if you dig, you will find it. 
and to put in the effort, the meditation, and the time, and you will see it. All right, the bottom of the page of 534 and also the bottom of the Kindle page. Only in order for the dormant feelings to motivate action, which is all, it all boils down to action. It's not enough just to have the feeling. But it has to come to what's known in Hebrew as Misa. If, if you want to know the most often quoted words of the Rebbe, at every talk, the Rebbe would go into deep subjects of Torah and weave it in with beautiful uh, current events of the time of what was going on in the world at, at that week, and also weave it in um, to uh, a Talmud and, and other parts of the portion, Torah portion, and the half Torah. But then the Rebbe would also end every talk with the words, Hamaisa Hua Iker, that the primary, the most important part of all this is the action. What can we take away with this? How will this make a change or a difference in our life? So the point of this whole chapter is to get the das, which is the meditation, in order to trigger this yira, this dormant feeling of, of reverence for God, um, to get it to shine, and to have that reverence in a revealed way in your heart. But the point of that would be to bring it out into action. So in order for the dormant feelings to motivate action, at the minimal level of reverence necessary not to sin, so that you, you turn away from evil which is a quote from Psalms, sur meira, va'ase tov, into action, speech, and thought. <clears throat> you need to bring out manifestly those, those latent, intangible feelings from the depths of your understanding heart. So the point is to bring it out so that you stop yourself from sinning, that you stop yourself from saying the wrong thing, from doing the wrong thing, and from even thinking the wrong thing. When you have yira shining, it will control your behavior. So it would help you be able to be on top of your, of your actions and be on top of your speech and be on top of your thoughts. So in order to bring it out, you have to reveal it from your understanding heart. And hold on one second, everyone. Let's... Sorry about that. All right, so we're back. So I, I love this paragraph where the point of this, this whole year of this whole meditation is not just to feel good. The point is to do good, to stop from doing bad. And every day we have feelings in our heart that tell us to do a certain thing or to say a certain thing. The point is that you want to be able to control those. So to, like, I just want to appreciate what we're saying here. In the past, in chapter 12, one of the main things we learned about for the Bainani you know, let me pause this for a second. Are you, are you recording? Yeah, I think we should be on. Yep, thank you. In chapter, thank you, Nancy. In chapter 12, we also um, de dealt with the same issue, that I have these burning desires inside of me. And uh, it's tempting me to, to do a certain thing that I know I shouldn't do. It's a sin. It's wrong. It's inappropriate. But how do I stop myself from doing it? I want to say something but I, I know I shouldn't. How do I stop myself from saying that? I'm thinking and fantasizing things. I know I shouldn't. How do I stop myself? That's the Bainanese dilemma. A tzaddik doesn't have this dilemma because they're fully in control. Their heart, their inner soul is shining strong, burning um, uh, godliness all day. But a Bainani is in that struggle. So in chapter 12, we said, your mind naturally can control your heart. Take it five minutes at a time. Right now, could you control yourself for the next three minutes? Yes. Do that for the next three minutes. And then do it for the next five minutes after that. Every moment is a battle. And at every moment, the Bainini can win the battle. That's the way we learned an important guidance from the Alter Rebbe in chapter 12. But now, this entire the chapter of the 40s, we're delving much deeper. We're not just relying on a, a Band-Aid fix which is in case of emergency, when, I have, when I, I have this burning rage inside of me, we should know that your mind can control your heart. Now we're trying to get deeper into our feelings. This meditation is to not only control the actions from the outside, but control them from the inside. If you work in your meditation, your feelings are going to be with an understanding heart, which means your feeling will have the das ability in your mind and then in your heart shining. And when you have that, 
you have the the, the the action will follow naturally to do the right thing and to prevent yourself from doing the wrong thing. When you have this reverence of your heart that comes through this meditation, it would be a much easier uh, process to stop yourself from sinning. Sin might come up. It might be knocking at your doorstep, but you could look at yourself in the mirror and say, no, I have a relationship with God that I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want to have in, in jeopardy. So that's the beauty of these chapters over what we learned about in the beginning of Tanya, where the beginning of Tanya was more a battle that is raging. And at the moment, before you're working on your insides, you have to put a fix on the outside. The fix on the outside is the band-aid realizing that you can control your heart at this moment right now. You can control your actions, your behavior. But... In these chapters, we're talking about the meditation, which means we're working on the inside, the soul powers inside of us. And when you're working on the inside, the outside flows a lot, a lot more natural. And therefore, your action, your speech, and your thoughts will be in line, your behavior will be in line with the feelings that are in your heart. Because the feelings now are filled with a reverence for God that comes as a result of this meditation. <clears throat> All right, let's see that a little more. So that's where we're really... We're tapping into it. This is where it boils down to the action part. What's the point of this whole meditation is that my action should follow. So let's see that we're really at the bottom uh, line of the Kindle page. And it says this, you need to bring out manifestly those latent intangible feelings from the depths of your understanding heart, which transcends time and make them conscious, if not as palpable feelings in the heart, then at least as tangible thoughts, a thought in your brain. And then you need to ponder these ideas deeply in conscious thought for a substantive period of time until this potential produces actual results, namely to turn away from evil and do good. In Hebrew, the words are sur meirav tov in thought, speech, and action. And this very basic level of your motivated of your motivated, not out, hold on, basic level, you're motivated not out of a profound reverence of and feeling for God, but merely because of the God who watches and, see, and, and sees, hears, and is attentive to and understands, which we say that in the high holiday prayers, all of your deeds. And he's checking your inclinations and heart. And it, as in the teaching of our sages of blessed memory, Consider three things, and you will come. You will not come to sin. Don't know what is above you: a seeing eye, a hearing ear, and all your deeds are recorded in a book. So nowadays, this last line is known as Amazon Alexa, where or or Apple Siri, where everything you say or Google, uh, Google. Um, Google Home, like all these things that you have in your home now, that basically is listening to everything around you. You have a seeing eye, a hearing ear, it's your ring doorbell or your nest, whatever feature you use in your homes. But all these smart devices is reminding us like what the Mishnah tells us 2,300 years ago, that all your deeds are recorded in a book. So obviously over there is talking about in the heavenly book of records. But if you realize it doesn't take a deep, uh, profound reverence over here we're talking about the basics the right the lower level of reverence realizing that there's a seeing eye a hearing ear everything is recorded that itself should be enough to motivate you into doing the right thing um, okay let's see this beautiful hasidic thought at the bottom i was born with an innate capacity to revere god which is always present in the depth of my soul but to access that capacity so that I can actually worship God with some real, real feeling. I need to make use of my das, which is my ability to take something abstract and make it tangible. In this task, I will be assisted by the energy of Moshe's soul, which I can access both directly, which means through the das that I possess inside of me, and through the sages of my generation that have this direct link and connection to Moshe. When I apply my das effectively through rigorous meditation, I can be assured that at the very least, I will acquire a basic feeling of reverence necessary for proper worship, that God is watching me 
and I don't want to disobey him while he's watching. So if I recognize and I realize that God is watching, I don't want to disobey God when he's watching me. So this is a beautiful summary of everything we learned about in this chapter, where I have the ability of revering God inside of me. Don't think it's something you have to find outside of you. It's something you already possess inside of you. You just have to dig and you find that treasure. And when you dig, how do you dig deep through meditation? What will you find? You will find this ability of das, which means to take what seems just as abstract and really make it tangible. And how do you do that? You could do it because you have the Moshe inside of you, the ability of Moshe nurturing the Das that you have, and also the Das that you receive from the leaders by connecting to the leaders and studying from the teachings of the leaders of that generation. And when you do that, you will recognize that God is watching over us. And as we, as we quoted at the beginning of chapter 41, God is putting everything aside. God has all the worlds that he created with all the levels inside of all the worlds, but God is checking you to see if you are serving him properly. And when you think of that, that God is watching over you, that reverence will shine and it will be able to control your behavior to be doing the right thing and preventing you from doing what is inappropriate, the wrong thing. Okay, any questions before we go further? <clears throat> awesome, okay, cool. I, I have a question, uh, Rabbi. Rabbi. A couple things, you know, when in, in 41, when, when we read everything that you, I do matters to Hashem, um, to me, that is a, a nice way, shall I say, of saying, you know, check my own uh, conduct, my thought, speech and action in a different way than, um, you know, what you were talking about, about uh, Nest or whatever, listening to me. It's as though... Uh, because I have that innate ability inside of me to realize that God is all powerful. He's everywhere. He wants to have a personal relationship with me and he wants everything I do matters to him. To me, that is a, a beautiful way of saying, um, you know, you have the ability, Nancy, to check yourself. Whether you do it or not, you have the ability to check yourself because everything that you do, Nancy, matters to Hashem. To me, that that is, I, and that meditation, I mean, if I do that meditation, as you say, frequently through the day, to me, it's not, oh, he's watching over you and don't be a bad person. It's that innately, I would know that because I have this relationship, I desire to do good not because i think i'm going to be punished right. but because of of a desire can you can you uh, mesh these two ideas together what we learn in 41 what we're learning in 42 i think you just explained it so beautifully that is, that is the right way of doing because of the desire to be connected with god but some people need that a, a little more i wouldn't say harsh um you know let me take a, a pause here the two perspectives you, you just shared nancy there's two general philosophies of our in our Judaism and how we relate to God and how we relate to ourselves, one is known as Musar, and one is more no, and one is Hasidus. Tanya is the foundational book of Hasidus, which is all about the incredible uh, natural soul powers that I possess that you just have to tap into and realize how great I am. Musar is very similar. It's also there to empower us, my friend empower us to be the best we can be but it, the the pathway to get there for us to be the best we can be is slightly the angle that it, they take is slightly different the angle they take is think of how low we are and how great god is both the end result will be the same that i need to serve god but Hasidus takes more the the pathway of look at the incredible value you have within you Musar is taking, look at how great God is and how low you are. Uh, both will take you to want to worship God, serve God and have a relationship with him. Uh, so I like the way you combine both of them together. You know, chapter 41 is saying God is putting everything on the side and God is checking in with you. Where are you holding? Are you serving? Are you in a relationship with me? Do we have a healthy relationship? And that's something that you have to check in. Where am I holding in my relationship? Over here, I'm not saying one is more than the other in terms of this pathway or not, but you know, combining them together is really beautiful. That um, the eye that 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 hears, sorry, the ear that hears and the eye that sees is more almost 
I wouldn't say intimidating, but it's it's uh, it shakes you into into good behavior, realizing uh oh, and just like we all know, right? I think we quoted from from Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the greatest sages who also lived till 120, like Moshe, um, on his deathbed. What did he tell his students when they asked him, give us some important teaching before you die, leave us with something important? What did he say? Do you remember? We learned it, I think, in chapter 39. What, what, did, what did Moshe say? Moshe said, know, Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka, he says that you should fear God like you fear mortal flesh and blood, like you fear people. And they said, that's it? That's your whole teaching you're going to give us at the end of your life? And Rabbi Yochanan responded, Halavai, that it should only be so. Like you should actually live up to this uh, level of uh, fearing God as you fear people. Because we all know that when people are watching, you're much more conscious over what you're doing. You're much more sensitive over what you're saying. But when no one's watching, whatever, it's just, it's just myself. So if you realize that God is actually watching you there, it has the ability to spring you into better action and behavior at that moment. So I think both are needed. And definitely I like what you said, Nancy. Awesome. Okay, and if you ever want, if you have the book inside, uh, like you have, if you own the book on 535, that little Hasidic thought that we just finished, I find it beautiful to really get a, um, a nice meditation going and, and um, realize the summary of this chapter. All right, 536, we will continue. This is section three now of 42. We're making our way slowly through the chapter. Um, how God knows his world. So now, till now, we were talking about this ability of Das, which means it's us knowing God through this recognition and, and this innate quality we have. But now let's see um, something a little bit deeper. 536, and I did not share the screen yet, so you wouldn't see it on Kindle. Okay. Section three at the bottom. The above quote describes, right, this quote that we just said from the Mishnah, which says that there's an eye that, a seeing eye, a hearing ear, and that all your deeds are recorded, the Sefer and Echtavim, recorded in a book. So uh, the above quote describes in physical terms, uh, God in physical terms as having a seeing eye, a hearing ear. Obviously, this is a metaphor, since God does not have actual eyes and ears. But if God's eyes and ears are not literal, is the idea that he's watching over us also non-literal? Meaning, if it says that God is watching over us, as a follow-up to the words that God sees and hears, God seeing and hearing is metaphorical. So what about God watching over us? Is that also metaphorical? Is that also not literal? The Tanya now assures us that this is not the case. While, and while God's seeing eye and hearing ear are metaphorical, since God has no semblance of a body, which we say um, uh, from the principles of faith of Rambam, known as the Yud Gimel, the 13 principles, Ikrim. That doesn't mean that God isn't really watching you, but to the contrary, the fact that he doesn't use actual eyes or ears means that his awareness of you is greater. Ah, what does this mean? Our sages hinted to this idea by stating, everything is revealed and known before him. The sages could have phrased this more simply and said, God knows. Why did they employ this somewhat cumbersome phrase, that everything is revealed and known before him. Like, why the double expression? It could have just said, God knows. As the Tanya will explain, the sages chose this phrase to teach us that God doesn't acquire knowledge in the same way that we do. For us mortals, there is a process. Initially, we lack knowledge about a certain thing. Then we gain access to some information. And after analyzing the information with our minds, we end up with the knowledge, right? That's Chachma. Bina and Das, that's the process. We don't have it and we acquire it. We gain the information in, this, in the method of Chachma. We analyze information in the method of Bina. And then comes the Das, which is now we have that knowledge, it's part of us. But this sharp dualism between subject, which is you, and object, which is the knowledge, couldn't be true of God, who is utterly one. God must know everything without having to go through the process of actually something, uh, coming to know it. <clears throat> this is why the sages imply that everything is already revealed and known before him in the past tense, so without him without him having to actively acquire the knowledge. So this is something that's hard for us to wrap our minds around because we can't relate to it as mortal beings, as created beings. We don't possess this ability 
to know something before we know it. We only know it once we gain that information. But by God, he is the source of all information. God is the knower, and we'll see soon a quote from the Rambam. Um, so by, the, by, by God, there is no process to gain knowledge. So when we say everything is revealed and known before him, <clears throat> it's written in the past tense because he already knows it. <clears throat> and also, just going back to the point over here, when it says um, that God has... Um, what was the quote? Hold on. Let's just go back a second. Oh, and all your deeds are recorded in a book. It's saying that God is able to watch us more than just with the seeing eye and hearing ear. Those are metaphorical. But his awareness is greater than we, what we can imagine. Because, and think of it, if God really physically has eyes, which of course God doesn't, there's only a certain amount you could hear. And with our eyes, there's only a certain amount you can see. There's also what you can see, of course. But by God, that doesn't exist. God knows everything, sees everything, and hears everything. So that's why the, the, the ability is different than what we could imagine. Let's see that. Let's see it a little further, and the al Rebbe will actually explain this inside. <clears throat> that is why, I think we said that paragraph. All right, so we'll turn the page here. Oh, and while we're on 536, we'll just... Uh, read that practical lesson, and it says like this. The fact that God doesn't have eyes and ears doesn't mean he's not watching you. He really is. And that's a simple, short, and sweet one, which most of us know that already, if you're already in the Tanya class. Um, okay, we're on 537 at the top, I think. Oh, oh, still at the bottom, 536. Okay, at the Kindle, it's at the top of, uh, of the page. And through knowing in this way, God's awareness of you is infinitely greater than, for example, through seeing with eyes or hearing with ears. The fact that God doesn't need eyes or ears to acquire knowledge doesn't make his awareness of your actions any less, since he doesn't suffer from any dualism. God's knowledge is actually more powerful because there is no schism between him and what he knows. And even though this concept defies coherent mortal, mortal comprehension, which like from the Rambam, he quotes that we can't understand how this works. The Tanya now teaches us an analogy to offer some insight into the way God knows some things automatically. So we can't really relate to it. But al Rebbe will give us an example how we can. Rather, by way of illustration, in Hebrew, the way of an illustration is a mashal. That's how you say um, an analogy or an illustration in Hebrew, it's called the mashal. God knows everything, not through an active process of acquiring knowledge, but here's the illustration, but like a person knows and feels everything that's happening and occurring in each of the 248 limbs of his body. Whether like cold or heat, or even to give an extreme example, heat in his toenail when it's scorched by fire. And so meaning a person feels even the toenail, which is such a low part of a person, such a uh, insignificant in re regards to the person's kidney or his heart or, you know, his brain, obviously, his toenail. But you feel heat or burn on your toenail uh, when it's scorched by fire. And a person also intuitively knows the status of the actual limbs themselves and their core and all that is affected in them he knows and feels automatically in his brain without having to consciously collect the information, right? When a person pulls a muscle, they already know what happened. They, already, they may have to go for an MRI so the doctor could um, understand this, this significant, the, the extent of it. And you may have, time, have trouble communicating it, but you know something happened to you. you. You feel it. Intuitively, you know what happened. In a vaguely comparable fashion to this, example of automatic knowing from within, God knows everything that's happening to all the creations, upper and lower. So it's amazing that the Rebbe is able to find an illustration to something that we can't fathom, how God knows something and doesn't have to go through the process of knowledge the way we have to. It's similar to us knowing something um, before, uh, uh, intuitively, without having to go to the process and focusing on it in order to gain that information. Uh, since the life energy of all creations flows from him 
as the verse states, for from you all things come. In Hebrew, the words were kimimcha hakol, and we say, and no creature is hidden from you. We actually say that in um, the high holiday prayers. The world's existence flows directly from God and is intimately connected with him. That's why he simply has knowledge of everything automatically without having to acquire that knowledge. It's not dissimilar. It's interesting how he uses a, um, a double negative over here. Instead of saying it is similar, he just says it's not dissimilar because it's not exactly the same, but it's just by way of illustration to the way you feel pain in your toe. You don't have to think. I wonder if my toe hurts and then go and find out when it hurts. You simply know. So that's similar to how the Rambam, which we'll quote now, how he explains God's ability of knowledge. The Tanya now cites sources from the Jewish philosophical and mystical traditions for the point of, uh, above point. And I will see from the Rambam. And then we'll go to other to the Ramak, which is Ramosha Cordovero, who was the um, uh, um, a Kabbalist in the 1500s. Um, in, in uh, the north part of Israel, buried in Tzfas. And it goes like this. As, and as the Rambam writes in the laws of foundations of the Torah, in the Hebrew, though, that is Yesod HaYesodos, and the Kabbalists have concurred, as stated by Rab Moshe Cordovero in Pardes Rimonim, that from knowing himself, so to speak, God knows all of the creations, since everything that exists in the heavens and the earth and everything in between only exists from the truth of his existence. This is the opening paragraph of the entire Rambam, of the entire Mishnah Torah of the Rambam. He says, so all existence is in part, part of him, in a sense, part of him. Everything that exists, it's from the truth of his existence, meaning it's all coming from God. So therefore, everything that, that happens is part of him. Rambam, so similar to us and our toenail, we, we feel what happens in our toenail because it's part of us. God knows everything happening in the world because everything comes from him. Everything is part of God. Rambam Maimonides writes that since he knows himself, he knows everything. There is nothing hidden from him. He doesn't know by means of an external knowledge that is separate from him, which is, by the way, the way we think. The way, oh, therefore, he is about to say the way we know things because we and our knowledge are not identical. But for the creator, may he be blessed. May he be blessed. He, his knowledge and existence are absolutely one. He is the knower. He is the known. And he is the power to know itself. All as one. In Hebrew, the, the word da means no. So there is, that's the shorish, that's the root word. But then using it in, in the three terms over here, it's hu amada, hu hayodea, hu hayodua. He is the knower, the mada. He is the known, and he is the power to know itself, because all of it comes from God. And Ramosha Cordovero, or he's known by his acronym of Ramak, similar to the Rambam, who is Ramosha Ben Maimon, he's known as um, Rambam. So the Ramak explains a Rambam statement according to Kabbalah. He explains like this. The power to know, he writes, corresponds to Keter, an energy that is aloof from the created universe and therefore precedes any knowledge of it. Keter, does anyone know what Keter means? Shira, do you remember? Very good. Shira um, uh, said that Keter is the crown. The crown, like we learned about before, goes above the head. So the energy of God uh, that's coming from the power to know is actually coming from Keter. That, uh, it's above the knowledge. It's the power to know. That is coming from uh, Keter and therefore it precedes any knowledge. The knower refers to the inquisitive mind of God, so to speak, which is his chachma, his wisdom. And the known is bina, the power through which God acquires real cognitive knowledge. And while all ten sefirot, divine energies, are united with God, Ramak reminds us that there are different grad gradations in this unity in contrast to the lower seven spheres which connectedness, whose connectedness to God's essence will fluctuate. The first three, which is Kesar, Chachman, and Bina, are united with him in absolute oneness, to the extent that even after they have been emanated and left God's essence, so to speak, wondrous things are said about the unity that the first three are considered as one. So this is a very, very deep paragraph, one of um, the complex issues that is dealt with in Kabbalah. And it's basically, the source of it all is about the oneness of God. 
if you really want to know the and really you know let's say let's let's just talk about um within within people relationships there's different ways of how people can relate to each other and really unite with each other one is through music a person with another person that enjoy the same type of music have something in common and they they have a deep connection based on the music that they enjoy. They could sit and listen to music together and the relationship they build by either sitting through a symphony that they both really um, have derived pleasure from listening to that music or just sitting at home on their couch, but listening to music together that they both enjoy, they develop a very deep relationship. A little bit of a lower one is, a, is, a, is an enjoyment of food. If two people enjoy the same type of food together, and they enjoy they sit around the table and eat it together, they bond over the food and because they have both pleasure in this type of food. But obviously the musical enjoyment and pleasure is a much deeper and more developed type of pleasure. And therefore the unity, the bond is going to be a lot deeper of a bond as well. Even higher and really the highest form of unity between people is a unity based on wisdom. When two people can think and, and deepen their thoughts with each other, which means they sharpen, they, they have a dialogue, they discuss things, and they wisen each other on wisdom, especially Torah wisdom. The bond that they're able to build is even deeper than anything else. When two minds click, it's even a higher than when, when um, two people click over music or over food, because the, the bond built in wisdom is deeper than any other. Over here, we're saying something else. We're saying that within God's ability of wisdom, which is God's Chachma and God's Bina, the soul powers within God, the Sefirot, Chachma and Bina, which is the knower and the known, and also the power to know, which is going to be Keter, all of those of three levels of God are all truly one within God. Those are united um, or to quote from the Ramak, from this Kabbalist, he says, wondrous things are said about their unity. So this is obviously deep idea. We don't have to get too much into it. It's not really part of the text, but it's just based on the Rambam that is saying that God, his ability to know, his knowledge and, the, and, and his existence and, and is all one. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible idea. Um, so let's, we're going to wrap up actually with just the next paragraph. We're going to stop a few minutes early. Let's see, just to take questions. Of course, all our efforts to explain God, God's knowledge with an example from human experience is fundamentally flawed, as the Tanya will now point out. So the author Rebbe did an incredible job, obviously, with explaining this as it, with an illustration of the burn on our toenail that we intuitively know. Similarly, God, who is the source of all existence, knows everything that is happening. And also we said like the power of, of knowledge that God has, it's all one. But this illustration back in the text of God acquiring knowledge effortless, effortlessly, like a person feels his limbs, serves only to calm the ear in an attempt to render the incomprehensible comprehensible. We can't really understand it, but in our attempt to try to make sense out of it, that's the best illustration we could come up with. But in truth, the illustration from man there is no resemblance to the reality of in God whatsoever. Um, okay, I think we will stop here for the day. Uh, we're close to section four, but I have my drum circle guy coming in a minute or two. So I want to make sure I'm there to set up camp. Um, all right, everybody, that was great. Uh, this Shabbos is the yard site of our dear Rebbe. Um, it's a very special Shabbos. We're going to have to put out, still finalizing some details, but we're planning to do something special here for Shabbos. Stay tuned for an email and um, we'll be in touch about that. So everyone have a great day. Where, wherever you are for Shabbos, um, make sure, to, if you can, to study a little bit of the Rebbe's Torah. Of course, you can study from the Tanya because uh, all the Rebbe's are connected. And when we, when we, like we learned from Moshe, that all the leaders are connected through Moshe. So definitely you can study from the Tanya. But if you have any of the texts or books of the Rebbe, uh, this Shabbos would be a great time to uh, uh, connect with, uh, with, the, with the Rebbe as well. All right, everyone, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.